The Suffolk County Sheriff was a key figure in the Google Killings investigation, providing jailhouse intelligence that helped investigators make their case against Rex Hewerman. Now, he's responsible for keeping Hewerman safe. And in addition, the security measures we will implement in our facility uh, to make sure that this individual is brought to justice the way he should be. So how is the accused serial killer faring behind bars? And what's the jail's role now as the investigation continues? This is Newsday's one-on-one -on -one conversation with Suffolk Sheriff, Dr. Errol Toulon, Jr. Hello and welcome to Studio 2 in Newsday's Melville headquarters for this Newsday TV one-on-one -on -one conversation with Suffolk Sheriff Dr. Errol Tuan Jr. Welcome, Sheriff, and uh, thank you for being here and for talking to Newsday TV and our Long Island audience about the ongoing Gilgo investigation. Uh, let's start on your turf in the jail, mm -hmm. yes. right, Riverhead. Um, is it still your, you still talk to every person who comes in your jail? Do you still introduce yourself to every person who goes into your jail? No, I do not. What I do uh, do is I do tour my facilities and I do talk to the, um, not only the individuals that are incarcerated, uh, my staff, um, medical staff, anyone that's uh, volunteers. So I really talk to everyone because it's really incumbent upon me to get the pulse of what's going on inside the facility. And, but do you talk to your prisoners as they come in? Do you introduce yourself to them? No, I do not. No, uh, you don't? No. What about Rex Hureman? He, I did. Why did you introduce yourself to Rex Hureman? You know, um, I've been in this business for, you know, I started my career in 1982, so almost 41 years. And even when I worked on Rikers Island, if we had anyone that was very notable, um, someone that may require special attention because either the crime they committed or uh, things that may be surrounding their case, uh, I would go in to make sure that they knew who I was uh, in case anything was to happen. And for what reason? What, what, why would they benefit knowing who you were? That you'd be there to... Well, it's more that they know who the boss is and that the boss has taken uh, some action or even some interest in knowing what's going on inside the surroundings that they're going to be confined in. So you, you're there to let them know what's what? Basically. That's correct. Now, Mr. Human has been in your custody since July 13th. Uh, he's pleaded not guilty. Um, and on the day of his arrest, during that press conference, you said that your job was to keep him safe so that he would meet justice, as it were. I'm paraphrasing you right now. What did you mean by that? You know, it's, it's more important for me that uh, Mr. Hewerman has his justice in the courts and not in the jails. Uh, I've experienced and we've also read different uh, accounts across the country where individuals of some notoriety have been assaulted or even killed inside jail. I do not want any inmate to really take liberties on Mr. Hewerman to, say, to uh, build up their own street credibility inside the facility, uh, a former sex worker encountering him, someone that may have been a John or a pimp, um, anyone that can say, you know what, I did this to this guy. I do know that many incarcerated individuals do feel that crimes against children and against women or something that they won't tolerate no matter what they're incarcerated for. So we just want to make sure that um, he sees his day in court. And he was on suicide when he went in and much was made of that. Is that normally what, ha is that normal procedure when he went into the jail? It's normal for someone of, uh, of his stature, and I don't mean Rex Hewerman, but someone coming into uh, jail uh, with the types of charges that he has. So. Uh, mental health will put him on suicide watch until they can evaluate him for a determined amount of time and then make that determination whether he should continue on suicide watch or be removed. And as of now, he has been removed from suicide watch? Yes, mental health uh, staff has removed him off of suicide watch. Does he still get mental health evaluations? Yes, not only does he get mental health evaluations, we still have staff that are, are closely supervising him. So you've talked to him once. Have you had a occasion to speak to Mr. Hewerman since then? No, you know, I've visited his housing area five times now. The first time was really just to introduce myself. Um, I think all of the uh, top supervisory staff in my administration have gone through and have uh, spoken to him, and not necessarily have a conversation, but at least introduced themselves. Because, you know, one of the things that we want, and really all of the individuals that are incarcerated, is to know who the bosses are in uh, the facility because sometimes if you're talking only to the correction officer or the sergeant, maybe even a lieutenant, 
uh, maybe the actions that may be necessary aren't taken, but if you know that you're going to be able to speak freely uh, to uh, the top-ranking officials inside of our administration, and maybe there may be something that needs to be done, maybe it's just someone that's venting, uh, I feel it's very important that we communicate with everyone. Now, when he first came in there, I would imagine that uh, it's got to be somewhat of a shock for anybody who to be in, uh, jailed for the first time in their lives. What was he like? What did, what did you all see? What did your staff see? You know, we saw someone that was sleeping a lot. Uh, he was on his bunk. Uh, the few times that I visited him in the very beginning, uh, either laying on his back or with his back against the wall, uh, he was still in a uh, suicide garment. He didn't have any sheets. There was nothing in his cell. And now, um, since he's been removed off his suicide watch, uh, he has sheets. He has access to toiletries. Uh, he's reading books. Um, sometimes he's watching TV. Sometimes he's reading the newspaper. What's a suicide garment? A uh, suicide garment really prevents an individual uh, from using uh, the shirt that he may be wearing or the pants, from um, using that to uh, potentially uh, hang themselves. So this really confines you to just this garment. And you talk to us a bit about most people have never been to the Riverhead Jail. Mm -hmm. So you said uh, you've been to where he is housed. Tell us a little bit about where he is housed. So where he's housed is a, a special housing area. It's more of a cell type structure. So it's the, the cell bars that you may see in some of the older movies. If you look at a jail or a prison, um, we have staff that's outside that will be, that supervise him to make sure that uh, he's okay. I mean, he, you know, this is a lot of stress, I'm sure, on a man that's 6'6", 270 pounds. And so if he should have some sort of medical emergency, at least not only do we have an additional camera that we put uh, to monitor the housing unit, but also um, staff there to be able to provide uh, emergency uh, treatment or care if, if it's necessary. So just to clarify, where he is, there are bars, and where other people are, there are no bars? So inside of uh, Riverhead, there are bars throughout the entire facility, where if you look at our Yapank facility, it's more of a pod-type structure. There are cell doors that open and close that has a glass that the correction officer will look in. Uh, how big is this cell? You mentioned how big he is. How big is his area? Uh, 60 square feet is a standard cell in New York State for all incarcerated individuals. And you say that his behavior has changed over the weeks. He's, he's reading books and such. Do you keep an eye out on, well, do you bring the books to him or does he go to the books? No, he goes to the books. And so naturally when he leaves uh, his housing unit, uh, we make sure that there's no inmate moving at that time. So if he's going to our rehabilitation unit to take a book out, if he's going to recreation, um, you know, we will then stop all inmate movement. Uh, basically all the other services uh, comes to him. Okay, so when, recreation unit, again, mm -hmm. most people have not been there. What is he walking into and so what he, access does he have? Sure, so he's walking into a yard where he has access to shoot a uh, basketball hoop. He's able to do pull-ups, dips, uh, push-ups, and basically Mr. Human is just walking, uh, doing laps, walking around the yard, which really isn't that big, but, you know, it is a space that's available for uh, recreation that we have for other inmates also. And how much time a day does he get to do that? One hour a day. One hour a day. So then he goes to where the books are, uh, you say where TV is. Does he have access to newspapers and such? He does have access to newspapers. The TV is actually in his housing unit, so he is able to watch it from his cell. So all together, I guess we'll try to go on the other way. How much time is he in his cell? Well. Wow. You know, it all depends on any given day, but we can safely say somewhere between 18 to 19 hours a day. And um, he's getting his mail now, I would imagine? Yes, he is. Okay. Do you guys monitor mail? So we do open up the mail. We do not read the mail. Uh, we open up the mail to ensure that there's no drugs because we ha do uh, have a problem like everybody else in the country with individuals trying to attempt to smuggle fentanyl or suboxone inside of a, a book or, in, or soaking fentanyl on top of a piece of paper. So we do check that, make sure that there's nothing, um, if pictures are coming in the mail, nothing explicit because we wouldn't allow that. We would then put those pictures inside of the individual's property. Define an explicit picture. Uh, a 
picture of a lewd act that's okay. occurring inside, you know, in a picture. If there's a picture with someone that's holding firearms, you know, is another type of picture we would not allow someone to have. Um, visitors. He's allowed to have visitors now, I would imagine. Yes. And has he had any visitors? Uh, he has had um, visitors, yes. And can you tell us uh, family, friends, lawyers? Uh, so, yes, he has had several uh, attorney visits with his attorney. Uh, he has had a, uh, two visits from an individual that he was associ an associate with. A friend? Yes. He would define as a friend, maybe. Uh, well, I, I wasn't sure if I would define him as a friend, but I would define him as someone Mr. Hewerman would want to meet because he has denied uh, several other people from visiting him. Oh, well, that, you're getting ahead of me a little bit because the question is, are people trying to get his permission to visit them? Is that the way it works? Yes. So an uh, individual would register for a visit, and Mr. Hewerman would, like any other inmate, uh, decide whether they want to accept or deny uh, that visit. Has he been getting a lot of requests? Uh, not that many. Not that in, many? In the very beginning, he, he did. He had about four or five requests that he denied. And uh, who are the requests coming from? Uh, media or some sort of, uh, you know, I guess criminal justice uh, or uh, this fascination of these type of crimes that maybe someone wants to see if they can get in and talk to him. And if he said yes, the answer would be yes. Yes. And how are those visits, how does, how does that work? Does it go to a different area? So with him, we would definitely uh, make sure that those visits are in a, a different area uh, because, one, we wouldn't want visitors or uh, any incarcerated individuals to have access to him. And would you say that he's assimilating the same way other people in the jail are, other inmates are? Yes, I, I would definitely see, see that he's definitely um, acclimating um, the way we, we would have thought. The one thing I am you know, very cautious about is the change when, uh, if there are different issues that comes up with his trial, uh, different evidence that may be presented, uh, to look for that change, possible change in behavior. Uh, well, he's been denied bail, so he's going to be there for a while, with you for a while. Correct. Now, we've talked about him, but you guys, you, there's a reason why you want to keep an eye on his behavior. Can you go right. into that a bit? Well, you know, I, I've seen over the course, you know, uh, during my, my tenure in New York City, from John Gotti to Bernard Goetz to uh, Joel Steinberg, watching how people's uh, you know, behavior has changed when they realize that, you know, this is a much longer process that they, that they anticipated. You know, the four walls of their cell starts to close in. There's not much more that they can do. Three months ago, he was walking around the streets of New York City. He was eating in a deli, eating in a restaurant, associating with his family and anyone else he may have wanted to be with. But now, all of it stops. And also the possibility of the people that he thought may have at least reached out to see how he's doing isn't occurring. And it starts to weigh on someone that's incarcerated. Well, you, you said before that um, you keep an eye out on all of this. So you're watching out for his mental health. You, everything is to protect him at this point and get him where he needs to be? Yes, protect him. And if we start to see any significant changes, we will notify our mental health and medical staff so that they can do a proper evaluation. Um, you guys, the jail, again, most people don't know this, but you're located right near the courthouse right there. Is it a, what does it take to move him from one place to the other? You know, it's a very easy process for us because we are so close in proximity to the courthouse, and so we are able to walk him uh, through an area to uh, from our facility into the courts without having to have to put him in a vehicle and transport him. And let me ask you this. You, you kind of referred to this before, but when he moves, nobody else moves. Right. Um, why is that? Well, we don't want anyone, you know, as I said earlier, to be able to... Uh, even attempt to assault him because if someone was to lunge at him if they're walking down a corridor in an area that he's in you know now from from me as an administrator my staff now it's a use of force we have to stop an individual from attempting to assault someone else and we have to protect uh, in this case Mr. Hewerman so you know to avoid any types of uses of force that may require um, uh, our staff putting hands on an individual the possibility of chemical agents the possibility of a taser we stop all movement. It takes a few minutes to get him from one location to the next, and then movement resumes. 
Well, it feels like a community, though, right? Yes. How's everybody else taken to stopping what they're doing while this, you're, you're, and I say this in quotes, celebrity guy moves around? You know, it's really not that big of a, a, a deal for us or I think the, the rest of the inmate population because there are different times, especially when we're taking our counts or uh, other activities may be occurring where the announcement will be stop all inmate movement. So, you know, no one would know, and this occurs in Riverhead and Yapang, if it's because of Rex Human or if it's because of something else. Now, let's pivot over to the investigation a bit. You were elected sheriff in 2018. Mm -hmm. How long has your office been involved in Gilgo? So in 2018, when we first created our human trafficking unit, which was late in 2018, there wasn't a task force, and we didn't know much about Gilgo as far as the sheriff's office. So what we did was we um, formulated questions based on media accounts, and what we may have heard from other law enforcement officials to uh, include in the questions of the various sex workers that were coming into our custody. Now, this is really a, a blind test to see if we can get anything or any information, but it really wasn't until the task force was uh, formed and we were intimately involved with the investigation where we were able to try and really contribute to um, uh, assisting in who this individual was. Okay, so let's backtrack for a little bit. You're talking about the Anti-Trafficking Initiative, right? Co correct. Which you put in there first in the country. Mm -hmm. You're already working with state, local, and federal on sex trafficking. Correct. So you on your own, again, just to clarify, you decided that I'm going to change the way we talk to women who come into the jail or other uh, people involved in the sex trade who come into the jail to try to see if we can get information on Gilgo? Exactly. You know, it, we, like, as I said earlier, we did not know anything. So, you know, we tried to formulate certain questions about Gilgo, about um, uh, anyone that might have been aggressive. Did they know anyone? Sex workers know other sex workers that may not be incarcerated. They also, um, unfortunately, are abused and really are reluctant to report it to law enforcement because of the activity that they're participating in. And so we really just threw out you know, we threw out questions just to see if anything would bite where we can say, all right, well, maybe this is a potential suspect or this is some information that we can share with the, either the district attorney's office or the police department. So that's pre-task force? Pre-task force because we started in 2018. Uh, started in 2018 with our uh, anti-trafficking initiative, but I think the questioning started in early 2019. 2019. Right. So now... You've got a district attorney and a police commissioner. They call you up and they say what? Uh, we want to form this task force and we want you to be included. And, and to both of their credit, both uh, District Attorney Tierney and Police Commissioner Harrison, when I met with both of them, when they both uh, took office, they wanted to include us in everything that was going on in both of their respective agencies. And, you know, they should take all the credit for... Um, uh, for the capture of Rex Hurman. It was their work. We were just, you know, part of this task force, but their agencies really were at the forefront of um, putting everything together with the state police and also the FBI. So what then was your role within the task force? So in our role within the task force is really um, working with the uh, uh, sex workers that were incarcerated. You know, any types of uh, clues, especially after, you know, a month after the task force was formed, we then had a suspect. And so if we were interviewing sex workers who really were giving us information that maybe did not fit Rex Hurman, you know, we, we knew who we were looking at, but we also had this information that we can now put on the side because we don't know if he committed all of these murders. And so we, did, we were able to at least uh, create a database, not only of the sex workers, um, information that they were able to give us, and also any other potential individuals that you know, we could possibly look at. So Rex became a suspect when? In 20... 2022, around, Mar around April, March, I believe. And did your work, your interviews with, your, with the sex workers, did that help them? Did that, did, had they identified them? Did your, were your interviews or re-interviews, did it bolster what they were looking at or just clarify it? It really, you know, we did not come across any women that... Um, had any interaction with Rex Herman until after we had his picture in the papers. And so after we had his picture in the papers, then uh, we were able to continue interviewing more sex workers, not only ones in our custody, 
uh, former sex workers, and it's really expanded even uh, further uh, since he's been captured. And what can, can you update us on the investigation? So, you know, as the investigation is going forward, I think um, uh, the district attorney is going to be the point person uh, to really uh, make sure that any information that the media should know about uh, would be delivered. But you knew I had to ask, right? Yes, Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I'm going to keep asking. Sure. Newsday has reported that the FBI, along with uh, law enforcement officials in South Carolina, are looking into the disappearance of a woman over there whose daughter says she saw him with a guy who looks like Rex Heerman. Are you guys involved in that in any way? Are they, are they looking for your help in any way? So what we're doing, um, we started this year a correction intelligence center uh, here in Suffolk County, and we have have now almost 40 partners across the United States, including some uh, across the pond from uh, El Salvador to the UK um, to Australia. And what we're doing now is we're reaching out to those jurisdictions, uh, their sheriff's offices, to see how we can work with their uh, potential sex workers that are incarcerated and interview them or have those jurisdictions interview the sex workers. Because what happens is sex workers arrested. They're with the police department one, two hours in a police precinct. But when they come to jail, they're with us for hours, days, weeks, maybe even years. And we have the opportunity to build a trust with them. We have this opportunity to learn more from sex workers. So we're looking from our aspect of the sex workers in, in not only South Carolina, but also Las Vegas, to see how we can draw information that may help the investigation. While we're not directly um, you know, going through, we, we, didn't, we weren't participating in the search of his home in Massapequa Park or in South Carolina or his residence in Las Vegas, but now we have the ability, because of the expertise that my staff has, to reach out to sex workers in those jurisdictions with their investigators and see what we're doing just like we're doing now with Nassau County, because Nassau County sex workers were never interviewed, and even New York City Corrections, who's really opened up, and we're going to be sending our staff to work and speak to uh, sex workers that are on Rikers Island. Well, in addition to speaking to the sex workers that you have dealt with, and part of your program, by the way, kind of helps sex workers get back on their feet, Correct. so you have a pre-existing relationship. Other women have stepped forward mm -hmm. and said, hey, I had a date with Rex Heuerman, I saw Rex Heuerman. Uh, how are you guys involved in vetting that information, or are you involved in vetting that information? So yes, we are involved in, in vetting the information, but what we do is we take all the information and we look at it uh, from a task force perspective where you, know, you have several different agencies that have expertise in several different areas to really see if a person uh, actually had some sort of communication or interaction with him or even any other individual. So, you know, it, it's really a, a, a great uh, opportunity for us to work collectively with no silos, which is the one thing I can say um, I'm very proud of is that we're not working within our own silos and all the information is presented to the task force. Now, the sex workers that you've talked to have had interactions with, with, with Mr. Heerman. How do they describe him or, or their interactions with him? The, the ones that we've spoken about more de describe not only uh, the large size that he is, because he is a very large man, but the aggressive nature of um, the interaction that they did have with him. But it, really nothing more. And, you know, I, one of the things that I really wanted to do in the very beginning when my, fr my staff first told me that, you know, we have a potential suspect, is that clearly we were able to avoid any uh, leaks and the confidentiality within the task force was maintained. And so I never knew Rex Heerman's name until six weeks bef uh, before I knew we were going to make an arrest. So I knew about his size, I knew where uh, he worked, I knew where uh, the location, I knew about the cell phone issues with uh, the boxes in Massapequa Park and that in Manhattan. But in order for me also to avoid uh, any conflict and any discussions, there were very few people in my own office that knew who Rex Heerman was. You said aggressive. What did you mean by that in those interactions? You know, and overly, you know, these sex workers have engaged in many, many different acts with many different in individuals. And so for them to feel that a particular person 
um, outside of a particular fetish that may have, but was somewhat aggressive um, in, in the act themselves is something how they describe. And I can't interpret for them, but you know, they're, you know, in their area, in their line of work, when they say that someone was overly aggressive, you know, with the, the many encounters that they may have had, you know, unfortunately they would know if someone was uh, a little bit over the top in the act that, they, that was occurring. Now you, you've talked to women, but you also mentioned before that you had talked to men who right. were involved in, in sex trafficking. Um, and you also said before that you don't know if there's more than one suspect here. Right. So are you talking to men? So inside of our facilities, our uh, SADI unit, uh, anti-trafficking unit, are talking to men. You know, they talk to everyone. Uh, we have a very, very low percentage of men that have been involved in the sex trafficking uh, industries. You know, it's majority women. And so we do not want to discount uh, anyone. And then not only do our um, anti-trafficking unit, our investigators inside of our intelligence unit are also interviewing everyone that comes into our custody not necessarily because of Rex Hurman or Gilgo Beach, but any other crimes that are being committed, Nassau, or Suffolk, or New York City. Well, this is Long Island, so of course we got to talk about politics, yes. right? Um, Suffolk is different from Nassau. Nassau, the sheriff is appointed. Suffolk, you got to run for office. Right. Uh, but unlike County Executive Steve Ballone, you are not term limited. Right. So you're going to go again? Oh, yes. Absolutely. My work's not done. Your work is not done. Your work in terms of SETI? Uh, my work, you know, in, in uh, gathering intelligence inside of our facilities that can help us uh, prevent contraband from being uh, introduced. Also, the crimes that we've been able to um, stop on the outside, because if there's a shooting in a particular community, these guys and girls are talking about it inside of our facilities, and they know who did it, why they did it, uh, gang issues that are occurring uh, inside of Suffolk and Nassau County. And so it's something that I'm extremely passionate about. Uh, and really, I love my job. Would you stay until Gilgo's all cleaned up, done, finished? I'll probably stay long past Gilgo, hopefully. All right. If the people and of Suffolk let, want Let's me. say you, there comes a point in time when you decide you want to go or the voters decide mm -hmm. that they want you to go. Right. What about your anti-trafficking initiative what would your hope be for that I think my hope for any of the units that we have um, brought forth or created in the sheriff's office uh, I'm hoping that the next person would continue uh, these initiatives because they're not benefiting Errol Toulon they're benefiting the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office with the expertise that the men and women have to really um, combat certain issues we have in our community whether they're drug related um, mental health issues uh, helping individuals that are incarcerated so that when they re-enter our communities, they can be better people and not recidivate. You know, are some of the things that I, I hope will continue. All right, and with that, uh, thank you, Sheriff Errol, Errol Toulon, Jr. I want to get that in there for joining us today. I'm Joy Brown for Newsday TV.